Uh, what I want to talk about is, is, the, is how uh, Ted and his students basically introduced cross-coupled flows into the, the world of geophysics. And it starts with Ted's work on induced polarization. Uh, if you have a, a pore that, that's blocked by a mineral grain, a metallic mineral grain, and you're trying to push a current through it, you have to overcome a, a potential at that surface to polarize the surface. And so there, this requires energy storage. If you turn the current off, the energy is released, and you, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, there'll be a decay of this voltage with time. So this is what Ted was studying, I guess, starting in the 1950s. And w one of the things that, th that was discovered was as they started looking at deeper and deeper ore bodies, because the shallow ones had been, been uncovered or, or discovered, they found that the anomalies were smaller. And there were effects due to background uh, IP effects, and it wasn't clear what was causing those. And this became the thesis subject for Don Marshall, who's here, was looking at how, what other mechanisms might be involved in energy storage. And so they looked at, at uh, chemical energy storage mechanisms, mechanical ones through, through water flow, and thermal ones through, through heat. So this, um, this is uh, from, from Don's thesis, and is there a point here? So what, what he shows up here is this cross-coupled flow system uh, where you've got the system and you can have a bunch of different uh, uh, flows going into it, electrical current, heat, solute, solvent, and whatever. And he, he formulates it uh, this way where he has the, these various flows due to cations and anions flowing through the, through the rock, in this case, solvent, the, the water, heat, and it can be driven by chemical potentials, electrical potentials, pressure gradients and temperature gradients. And he, they, they worked from the ideas of Onsager on these uh, irreversible thermodynamic systems. And you end up having a system where you have this generalized conductivity matrix. And if, if we have no cross-coupling properties, the only elements in this matrix that exist are, are on the diagonal. And all the cross-coupling comes about be, are, is uh, represented by these off-diagonal terms. And under proper conditions of, if you pick the units uh, of these fl uh, flows and, and forces correctly, and you have uh, irreversible, uh, you have, you, uh, microscopic reversibility, you, you then can show that this matrix has to be uh, symmetric, diagonally symmetric. So uh, we'll take one example, basically streaming potential. In this case, you've got uh, the driving forces are, are potential or p pressure gradients. Uh, there, there can also be an electric gradient. This will cause fluid fl or uh, electric current flow, and the pressure gradient will cause uh, water to flow. You could also have water flowing because of, a, of an electric gradient. This is a, a picture of a, uh, of a pore space. Uh, the silicate minerals will have a negative charge because of broken crystal structure, and to, to uh, uh, obtain electrical neutrality, you end up having an excess of, of cations near the surface, some of which are, are not mobile and others which are. But in this mobile uh, population of ions, you end up having more positive ions than negative ions. So when you put a pressure gradient across it, you end up moving more positive than negative ions, so you, es you ha essentially have a current flow uh, or you going in the direction uh, of to lower pressure. This generates a charge separation which in turn creates an electric field which drives back a counter current. And since the, the current can't flow, it can only flow through this pore in this little simple example, you end up having a situation where these two currents are, are matched and go to zero. And you can then rearrange this equation to basically get the ratio of the, of the uh, electric potential gradient over the pressure gradient under this condition of no current flow. And you come up with, with this, where you, uh, ratio of the conductivities, this cross, this off diagonal term uh, here, which relates the, the pressure gradient to, to current, and this one, which re is basically the, the electrical conductivity. And we call this ratio the cross, uh, in this case, it's an electric kinetic or streaming potential cross coupling coefficient. You can have a similar sort of situation if the driving potential is, uh, is temperature or if the driving potential happens to be chemical gradients. So um, Ted ha had a, a student, uh, Bijan Nurbehecht, who, uh, who is from 
Iran, and uh, unfortunately he, he died fairly young, and he had, uh, after he returned home, and he looked at, the, at how you, what the governing equations were for um, current flows generated by these kinds of mechanisms. And if you take the, 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 current we, the uh, expression we had for the electrical current before, it's this way, you, you can rewrite it so that you basically factor out the conductivity, uh, the electrical conductivity, and you come up with a term which is electric potential plus the, uh, the streaming potential coefficient times the pressure. He, he renamed this a total electric potential because the gradients of it basically are, describe all of the current flow. Uh, be, because the divergence of the current has to be zero, you, you can show that you have Laplace's equation to, uh, to solve to figure out what the total electric potential is. And there are a couple boundary conditions, you know, the usual things that we're accustomed to for electrical properties uh, uh, at boundaries of, of conductivity, the, the potential is, is continuous, uh, for fluid flow the pressure is continuous, but if you look at, at what happens to total electric potential, uh, at boundaries it basically jumps by an amount equal to the, the jump in the, in the uh, uh, streaming potential coefficient times the pressure at the boundary. Uh, you also have this condition of you know, normal electric current flow has to be has to be zero or continuous has to be continuous at boundaries. So Norbehecht looked first at this very simple case of a homogeneous Earth where you've got a, a conductivity here sigma one in the air the electrical conductivity is zero. There's a stream potential coefficient down here. There's there's none at the surface, and uh, so the governing equation is Laplace's equation. The normal derivative uh, uh, at the surface of the, of the potential has to be zero because there's no current flow out of the, the boundary uh, right into the half space. And you get a simple solution that this total electric potential is, is constant. So if you were to, in this case, you try to measure the electric potential with, with some, uh, some electrodes on the surface, you end up getting a, an answer which is constant. So, so you, you can't, with this very simple case, observe an anomaly. He then looked at this more, slightly more complicated case where you have a layer over a, over a half space so that you have a difference in, in coupling coefficients and you, and you, and you may also have a, a difference in conductivities. And so in this case, you would have a jump in this total electric potential and this essentially are, it ends up being the driving force for the current flow in the whole problem. So what you have to do is find you, find, you have regions where you have uh, a jump in, in this potential times the, a, a driving force, in this case the pressure. Now it, it, if you Im imagine the case where, where this is uniform across this entire boundary so that this function f on the boundary is constant. And if you have a situation like that, you get this, you have, the solution here is that the total electric potential is constant and you have the same situation as what we had in that previous simple example, so that in fact there's no observable anomaly. And, and that's what we show here is basically if the, if the tangential gradient of, of, of the driving function on this boundary is constant, there's no anomaly. And this was, uh, was one of the things that Norbehecht picked up on and came up with conditions in order to have an observable anomaly. And essentially what you have to have is you have to have uh, the, the gradient of, the, of this driving function cannot be continuous on the boundaries. And you could, if, you're a, if you're familiar with magnetics, you could, the, the mathematics of this are simple, similar to having a, um, basically a magnetized uh, sheet. If you have a uniformly magnetized sheet that goes off to infinity everywhere, the magnetic field on the surface is, is constant. So it's the same thing. You basically end up getting, you see something on the surface because there, of this edge over here and this, this edge over here, you know, assuming it's uniform in between. So now I'm going to look at some examples of, the, of what Norbehecht looked at uh, to apply this stuff. And the first one comes from the, uh, the Cold War. So in, in the, uh, I guess in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the U.S., the Soviet Union, and Great Britain started thinking about nuclear test ban treaties because they were concerned about all this radioactivity that was coming up into the atmosphere. And one of the components that was suggested for the test ban treaty was that you have on-site detection of nuclear blasts. 
and uh, the, the Russians opposed this, but the question came up, how do you go about telling if there was a, a blast you know, after the fact? Well, if you had a, um, if you had, let's say, a 20 kiloton nuclear blast, it would, it would boil water within a 50, radi 50 meter radius of the, of, of the explosion site. So you have a, a, a large source of heat, high temperatures. This would, you'd also be driving uh, fluid away because it's all, it's all turned to steam, so you, you can generate, uh, there, there's a potential gradient in the ground. So the, the idea was, could you see uh, an anomaly due to thermoelectric or electrokinetic potential or sources? So the first thing you have to have is you have to have a boundary, as we saw. So, uh, so what Norbehek looked at was having a pressure source at, at depth uh, below some, some material. And typically, these, these bombs were at the Nevada test site were down about 400 to 500 meters depth. And he was able to, to see that the thermoelectric anomalies were much too small to produce anything that was going to be observable. But you could get something from the streaming potential. And this is an example of what he calculated, uh, basically a normalized voltage uh, as distance fr from the source. And this is a spherical source. And these are curves showing how the anomaly changes as the source moves uh, above and below the boundary. So that you get the largest anomaly when, when the pressure source is near the boundary, as you'd expect from, from what we'd shown before. So this is an, an, uh, uh, some field data that he he was able to analyze where they had a this 37 kiloton blast. It was at a depth of 440 meters. And this was the potential measured on the surface uh, as a function of time. And initially, there was this, this huge positive peak, which was interpreted to be due to, uh, due to uh, fluid flow away from the blast. But very quickly, it dropped, became negative, and then it recovered very slowly. And what they think happened in this case is that the blast actually vented to the surface so that you, it lowered the pressure at depth so that you then had a lower than hydrostatic pressure in the ground and you end up having fluid flow back towards, towards the blast site. And this was the anomaly that lasted for, uh, well, here they had, they recorded data out for 90 days. So he was able to fit this to, uh, to his model. This was the, these were the data from the negative peak, the, the long recovery. And the, the parameters that he got agreed fairly well with what they knew about the test site. And the ones from the positive anomaly didn't fit very well, as you'd sort of expect, because the, the geometry was not this spherical geometry. You, you, the pressure was going up through the, some sort of a cracking area rising to the surface, and so it was more complicated. The bottom line on all of this is that they eventually decided not to allow on-site detection or, or verification. In 1963, they came to an agreement, and President Kennedy signed the, this partial nuclear test ban treaty. So um, this was never actually used. And I'll switch to uh, geothermal work. Uh, this is uh, a, a geothermal field, or self-potential data from a geothermal field in Mexico. Um, these were data collected by Bob Corwin. And you've got this dipolar anomaly, which you usually see if you have some type of a fault situation. And the model that, that uh, Bob and I used to fit this is basically some sort of a, a rectangular patch on the fault where you have difference in physical properties across the fault. And, and, and this shows the data that uh, collected and you're able to, uh, to make a match to this. And the, the depth to the top of this corresponds to where the production zone is. And the, the, the conductivity change across, uh, we see across this corresponds to surface resistivity measurements. Bill Sill thought of a different way to do this. The, 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 the model that I was doing was basically just fitting an electrical source to, to the data. And what Bill Sill tr decided to do, since uh, another one of Ted's students who, who was going to be here but wasn't able to show, uh, uh, he looked at wh why not model the primary flows. And so this geothermal system, he, using electrical resistivity data, this is in, um, in Utah, he, he was able to come up with a, 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 a structure for, for the ground, the resistivity model, and uh, electrokinetic, uh, well, he, he estimated the thermal uh, conductivities, and he estimated values for the, uh, the cross-coupling coefficients. There's essentially a fault zone over here. Uh, 
And then he modeled the, the, the heat flow problem. He had temperature cores of, uh, here, and th these are his modeled uh, isotherms, and also he had heat flow data. And from this, he was able to then come up with a, a data to match the SP values that were measured across the, the surface here. And you can see this is his model, and these are the observed. This is this, this fault zone over on this side. Um, just briefly talk about the next thing has to do with earthquakes. If you have stress changes in the ground, it's going to cause fluid flow. This could cause electrokinetic uh, currents. And it was proposed by uh, uh, Mizutani and his associates in the, in the early or mid-70s, I think it was, to, that you might cause magnetic fields to be associated with, with the earthquakes. And being familiar with this work of Nurbehex, I was able to see that, that you're not going to have an external magnetic field because the currents that are generated, if you have a spherical geometry, will end up being toroidal, and so there's no external field. But you can, in, f in fact, if you have a faulted uh, geometry case, you can get magnetic fields, but they're probably going to be a little dicey in terms of monitoring them because they're so small. However, there is an associated electric field, so there may, in fact, be self-potential uh, measure measurements that could be used uh, to look at some of these stresses. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, this is work done by Bob Corwin, who was probably the best uh, field geophysicist for collecting SP data. And he was hired by the Corps of Engineers to come up with a way to locate these uh, revetments. These are articulated concrete mattresses. So they're blocks of concrete held together with stainless steel ropes. And they're typically 100 to 50 feet wide and well, 100 feet wide, maybe 500 to 1,000 feet long. And they, they use them to line the bank of the Mississippi River. And they have over 1,000 feet of these in place. And they've been doing this since 1915. And they're put in to, uh, to protect the erosion of the bank and to keep the flow path, path pretty smooth. And the question is, after you put one in the, ground, in the river, is it still there or not? Because they can be, they'll be covered up with sediments and they may be transported away. Oops, went too much. Go back. So th these are uh, Corwin's data. So th uh, this, is, uh, this is a bathymetry showing the bottom of the, of the river. The bank's over here. The deep water's over on this side. And he, he measures the, the SP or the, uh, the, the Xs. And then just using a very simple model of basically a, a current uh, you know, positive pole and a negative pole, he gets a fairly good fit to the, to the data. And he, you can see that, that this source is down below, below the, 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 uh, the bottom of the river. And in fact, he has other data where he shows it, where you can see when they just installed one, you can see it right on the, on the bottom of the river, the riverbed, or other places where they, they're not there. And you, and you essentially get a flat uh, uh, self-potential anomaly. So it's, it turned out to be a really uh, good way to, to uh, monitor these things. And then last, um, I learned a lot of things from Ted. And there were there's sort of like uh, three, three things that always sort of stick in my mind. Uh, one is, he, he always said, geophysics is not highbrow. He said, keep it simple. And you know, the, the gray peril is sort of the, the essence of that, since the, all the world can be modeled as a uh, transmission surface. It's simple. It's not highbrow. <laughs> uh, and the other thing was, is it cosine square law? Sometimes Ted would be looking at some work that you'd done, or you'd have some objection to something that he was talking about, and he'd say, "But what about this effect?" He said, "Oh, don't worry about that. That's, that goes as the cosine squared of some small angle." <laughs> now, whether or not it was true or not didn't matter. His, his physical intuition was right on the money, and it was like, "Okay, recognize what's important and focus on that. Don't get distracted by this other nonsense." And the last thing was, "Have a good time while you're getting the job done." And I remember the first time I was in school here, I went to the field, and he called me up in the morning. He said, what kind of sandwich would you like for lunch? <laughs> so he told me what he could get at this, his local deli. Uh, and uh, so I told him. So he, and, I thought, and I thought, he got off the phone. I thought, man, this is great. You know, he's bringing lunch. And it got even better because when he opened up the cooler at lunchtime, not only did he have sandwiches, he had beers. <laughs> so he taught me you know, how you're supposed to treat the field crew if you really want to get work done. <laughs> You are lucky when you worked in the field with him, yeah, sandwiches. When I worked in the field with him, 
All we got is beer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Not much of a beer, maybe. <laughs>